Welcome back, friends, to the sixth edition of the Mark Claire Show. It's a very special episode for a number of reasons. Uh, it's the first episode in the month of December. That's very exciting. Uh, it's also the second full month of the show. Also very exciting. I have an awesome guest today, the great Jim Bob. Again, very exciting. If I seem like I have a little more energy than usual, it's also because this is the first sponsored episode of this program. We are sponsored by Fox and Sons Coffee, and I'm wide awake. It's Sunday morning as I record this intro, and I'm drinking some Fox and Sons Coffee. And it's legit, my friends. It's legit. I have been a coffee drinker. Blah, coffee drinker. I have been a coffee drinker for years. Um, but I never had a refined palate. I never knew what good coffee really was until my friend Stephen Fox sent me a bag of his Fox and Sons coffee. And he will verify this. I said he approached me about sponsoring the show. I had known him for a few years. He was a fan of mine through Lions of Liberty. But I said, look, I, I want to try the coffee first because I got to know. I can't just, you know, I can't just be blowing smoke here, all right? My audience trusts me. Uh, let me tell you, there is no smoke to be blown. Fox and Sons coffee, you open this bag and I'm going to show you the bag. This is the evidence right here. I actually bought a one pound bag of this coffee. And you open it and you smell these beans. Now, if you can't see this bag, it's because you're not watching the video. So a good time to plug the video uh, channels. YouTube, of course, while I last. Uh, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, of course. You can support me on Rockfin as well. Uh, but I digress. The real reason I'm talking about this right now is because this coffee, I can't, I can't stop smelling it. This is legitimately what I do. I open the bag every morning before I go and uh, grind it up and uh, you know use my French press. That's my preferred method to make a cup of Fox and Sons. I take a big whiff of those fresh beans, and my God, it's night and day for how I used to drink coffee before. Uh, I prefer the dark roast. I'm a dark roast kind of guy. That's what I got, but you can check out all of your options over at foxinsons.com, F-O-X, the letter N, S-O-N-S, and Stephen developed a passion for coffee, uh, drinking coffee with his father growing up as a kid, so that's why he started this business to show his sons, not just to uh, you know share his love of coffee with them, but to teach them about entrepreneurship. Uh, so I'm so excited to be having Fox & Sons Coffee as the first official sponsor of the Mark Claire Show. So do head over to foxandsons.com. I will, of course, link to this in the show notes, wherever you find those. And you, if that wasn't enough, I don't think it was enough. So we're going to go further. We're going to go deeper on this offer. Um, we're not just going to tell you about Fox & Sons. We've got a great discount code. It's very simple. Think about the show, Mark Claire Show, MCS. That's your discount code. You use discount code MCS and you're gonna get your third bag for free and you're gonna want your third bag. Trust me, again, I got a pound of this stuff and I'm probably gonna go through it before the end of the month at this rate and I'm the only one drinking. My, my wife can't drink coffee, it's a whole thing, but leaves more for me, so that's very exciting. So. Head over to foxandsons.com, use discount code MCS to get your third bag for free. You want to make sure you order by December 19th if you're going to be placing orders for Christmas because that's, uh, that's the last day we can guarantee that he'll be getting those out for Christmas. So head over to foxandsons.com, use discount code MCS, and support Stephen Fox, the very first official sponsor of the show. I'm very excited. Thank you for hopping on board the Mark Claire Show. Stephen, that being said, as I mentioned up top, I've got an awesome guest today. He is the creator of the channel Made by Jim Bob on YouTube. He's also an incredible memer and cartoonist. Very pleased to be talking to Jim Bob. Welcome back, gang, to the Mark Claire Show. With me today, he is a, a cartoonist, a meme creator. Uh, you can find many of his memes in the books Savage Memes. He is also the host of the YouTube channel Made by Jim Bob, where he streams quite often about topics including religion and uh, various topics of the day. I'm very pleased to welcome Jim Bob. Jim Bob, welcome to my show. Howdy, y'all. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks, for, thanks so much for coming on. Um, I, I'm glad you could find at least a little time away from streaming because it seems like you're, anytime I log on to YouTube, you're, you're on there uh, doing a stream about something. But uh, I kind of want to just start getting to know you a little bit better before we dive into, you know, various other topics I have uh, on the agenda. But I'm really curious specifically, you know, you do talk a lot about religion and religious beliefs and that sort of thing. So I'm kind of curious how you came to that. Were you, did you always, uh, were you always a Christian or did, is that something you kind of found your way into and um, kind of take us into how you found your getting into creating these memes sure yeah uh well i was raised christian but it was kind of like and i think it may have been like i didn't know how to categorize it then it probably was like born again reformed you know i, I grew up in this church where um there was a, a pastor with a white 
ponytail and a Fender guitar and fancy suits and snake snakeskin boots, Mercedes, uh, a push buddy but- father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. A, a push button stage that opened into a, uh, a baptism pool and such. <laughs> um, but regardless of the, the kind of church it was, it was my mom primarily, uh, you know, with my dad, but primarily my mom, who's really passionate um, about the Bible sort of yoked me, uh, so to speak, uh, planted the seed in all of us children. And so my natural rebellion occurred, you know, obviously, you know, commonly 14 years old and, and, and above. And so, um, when I left, uh, the Catskills in New York, where I grew up, uh, with my friend to Los Angeles, I pretty much replaced, um, you know, Christianity with everything else, um, you know, hedonism, futurism, technology, entertainment, self-worship, drugs, alcohol, all of it. Right. And um, and so um, I pretty much lived like that for probably 15 years straight uh, in my time in Los Angeles. And then um, I met my now wife, um, you know, after a lot of other things, Um <laughs> And uh, we had children, our, our first child, about seven, almost seven years ago now. And I think that was the thing that shifted. How I explain it is, um, you know, you hold your child for the first time and everything you thought you prescribe, you know, you subscribe to and would prescribe to others suddenly goes through this filtering system. It's a bullshit filter. And, uh, you know, it's a colander effect where everything's strained out that's no longer necessary or even true, more like luxury concepts that you kind of dabble in. A lot of the new age stuff kind of withered away in that moment because I was uh, posed with the question, what am I what do I think I believe? And uh, a, a test for that is, am I willing to teach my own child that? And I that simple uh, confrontation with myself uh, allowed me to put down a lot of nonsense baggage, uh, which I'm so happy that I did. And so, yeah, that was just my re-entry way to something bigger. Now, when I started doing memes, I was doing very topical, superficial stuff like Game of Thrones stuff and cute, quirky stuff. Um, and then I criticized Obama because at the time I had voted for him, of course, being in Los Angeles. And I remember drawing a, uh, you know, he has that, famous picture or moment where he drops the mic, right? He's a, Oh, he dropped the mic. He's such a good spokesperson. Well, I just swapped the mic with a bomb because that's what he did really dropped. He dropped a lot of bombs, not a lot of mics. He dropped way more bombs than mics. And so, uh, I saw the reaction with my peers and, and, and friends, uh, because I was criticizing Obama and I realized, Oh, wow. Simple imagery even very crude drawings, if the message hits and it hits a target, there's something very powerful there. And that's, that was the beginning of my memeing uh, career. And uh, it wasn't, and it was also the beginning of what I need, what I wanted to say. I wasn't actually sure what I was going to say. So so the people reacting to that initial meme, like you weren't really even thinking about, you know, creating a channel or anything like that. You were just kind of having fun. So it was their reactions. That's pretty interesting to me that I, I, what I assume if you were had a bunch of friends from Los Angeles, they were like visceral reactions against mm-hmm. what you were saying. So yeah. that kind of sparked something in you. I'm glad instead, instead of you retracting from that saying, Oh no, I'm pissing people off. You said, Oh wait, mm. I'm hitting buttons in such a simplistic way. Yeah, exactly. I look at it like, uh, you know, when a plane takes off, it needs the resistance of the air underneath it to push it up. So any of the resistance I experienced, I knew right away that that was a part of, um, you know, a movement towards something. It was a medium, basically. It was like it was almost like the resistance that you get is the medium you're kind of uh, playing off of. And so I knew provocation was my thing. And it was always my thing. I was always like a wise ass. I was kind of a smart ass kind of bully in high school. Uh, not the kind that was physical, more like jokes and, and hard hitting insults and stuff. And so that obviously that's still a part of my my rhetoric um, through the memes and also just live streaming. Um, but I realized, well, if you're going to be provocative, you still need a worldview, you, you know, and I realized after having children that uh, for a man, their worldview is really uh, essential in what they're doing, because if they're pointing and, and women are following and other men are following, you can't just point It's say you can't just arbitrarily point. Well, you can. Many people do it. But you, you realize that especially as a truth teller, storyteller, a comedian, 
um, any of the the variety of expressionists that um, that are within my my niche, um, you it's the it's a really good idea to uh, structure your your what you're saying around something fundamentally bigger than your opinions, right? And so that kind of led me back to Christianity because I examined all the other ones and. Um, and, uh, you know, when, once you're saying, once you realize that truth is your, your pursuit and not like republicanism or constitutionalism, you start to ascend beyond, um, some of these smaller, lower level dialectics that are kind of sold to us, um, the, these false binaries or they're, they're binaries like left, right is a real binary, but it's false to state that that's the, the only war going on. And so, I started seeing through that very quickly with people, um, you know, engaging with people like Owen Benjamin, but at the other, uh, another side, uh, someone like Jay Dyer, I'm kind of like right in between them. I like, I got the perfect uh, amount from each of them in my view, as far as, uh, uh, information or, or views or methods or humor and whatnot. And so they, they, two of them influenced me uh, a lot. And so, um, I kind of just ran with it. I'm still running with it. Yeah, that, that tracks. I can see de definitely a lot of each of them in, in both in, in you in some way. Um, I want to go back a little bit to dig into more about your time in Los Angeles. I, too, did about a 17-year stint in Los Angeles before, not coincidentally, when I got more serious, had a wife mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. It was like, okay, this isn't the place to be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm curious how much you think that that place specifically was part of your sort of you know getting into – degenerate type things or whatever it may, might be that you were filling that hole since you hadn't really necessarily embraced the religion fully that you were brought up with. Mm -hmm. um, or do you think it's something that no matter where you were, because you had not really accepted it all the way as a worldview, you would have sort of found yourself replacing that with, with something no matter where you were? Um, I think it's a combination. I think people do rebel, uh, men and women at a certain age, they rebel. It's our, it's the part of us, uh, the rebellious part of us, which ironically, um, you know, goes hand in hand with an idealist view. So we, we, you know, in order to pursue some idealist uh, notion, you know, a lot of us in our youth, we go toward idealism. And then what we do is we break down, we try to break down traditions and we say, well, that's just old. I mean, it's very old. We have to do away with this old stuff because the new is approaching and you can't stop the youth kind of thing. And we all get this like, sense of pride and urgency and we have a vision and that's kind of why bernie sanders you know can can constantly be relevant even though he's irrelevant is that there's always a new generation who's vulnerable to the rebellious nature but um attributes um you know in a behavior right they they have to point to something bigger out there that we can get to finally right and there's this this revolutionary spirit that's paired with rebellion always and it's not an accident that the the you know people who rebel God are all also uh, very um, you know passionate about some new world that they can create, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of funny. It's just an inversion of like um, trans transcendence, right? Or some notion that we can get back to um, Eden, right? Oh, you know, we can do it if, if just enough people just realize, you know, compassion and you know saving the penguins or whatever. Um, and so I think we're all all vulnerable to it for me. Um, I'm, you know, my, uh, you know, what I was drawn to as, as a man was definitely, uh, you know, fleshly desires and, uh, experiences and, um, you know, being wacky and, and being, being able to be a, a provocateur and a shock artist. Right. And, 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 you know, because that's the absence of standards. Now that I see now when you remove standards, it's like, let's say you were teaching an art class, and you announced that there was going to be a competition, uh, you know, in the next month. And one student asks, well, what are what's the judging standard? And the teacher said there's no standard. Right. So the moment there's no standard. Right. And you reject God in this case is the, the metaphor is that you have to invent a standard. Now, the only way to, to be seen in a standardless um, um art let's say in the art show or life itself is to be loud to be uh very offensive to you know vomit on yourself you're basically trying to cross lines because there is no standard so the new standard is absolute debauchery like the loudest the most disgusting because that's the only possible standard you can reach it, it's 
it's not beauty. It's not form. It's not uh, aesthetics. It, it's just the rejection of all standards is the standard. So there's a paradox and a self contra contradiction there that I kind of knew that I was participating in for a little bit. I was like, okay, there, you know, there's no uh, T loss. There's no higher purpose when there's no standard. And so, you know, you see all these artists who, you know, like the Lady Gaga, you know, I call her Lady Dada because like Dadaism, the, she represents that, that I think it was the 20, you know, 1920s and on, right? This notion of upending all standards in art and form, uh, changing everything, making it so obscure and uh, ambiguous, right? And so structure, um, uh, theology actually disambiguates a lot of this stuff that as as children and as early teens and early 20s men and women we're trying to like break down right? got to it's stopping us from reaching our full potential this kind of no thing and it's just so immature at this point N now that i look back I i'm i'm slightly embarrassed but of course how would i have known um at that point i wasn't surrounding myself with anyone who was uh, objecting to it so yeah, and I think many of us, and uh, I guess when I say many of us, I just mean like all young men in some way probably going through life, uh, we get to a point where we just feel like being edgy or rejecting whatever we were taught is what's cool, and then being cool is what makes you edgy, and, and then suddenly you, you you realize at some point, maybe when it is time to get more serious about life, like, oh wait, I, I actually just believed in nothing and was just flailing about trying to act as cool as I could in whatever way that is, but there was actually nothing there, you know? Okay. And so I, I think a lot of us go through that when we get a wife or has to have kids or what it may be. We, we have to, you do, like you said, you have to think about what I teach my kids this. So suddenly orgies and cocaine don't seem as appealing because they in no way meet that standard. Right. Absolutely. And even if you have a good skill, I mean, there are people who are <laughs> technically amazing, whether it be music or drawing, but if they have nothing to say, um, their standard just becomes technical, which at least is a step up from just not having anything. Right. But then you start asking questions of like, what's the basis for, for this stuff? What's the basis for aesthetics and beauty and goodness? And what did it, what does it mean to bring beauty into the world? And what, and in what framework am I bringing beauty into the world? Now this can get inverted of course, because some people could look at like some weird pseudo blood ritual at a party as beautiful. Right. And people, mm -hmm. you know, and they do that. And so uh, that becomes the battle. And so you realize that the battle um, at least at the early stages, when you abandon sort of this leftist uh, arbitrary uh, subjective view, right. A relativist view, you at least go toward truth and then you start, um, at least I did, I abandoned ship and became sort of like a safe libertarian, classical liberal, uh, Thomas Sowell this, you know, Prager you that, all, all of the people who are there to rescue people who jump off the sinking sort of liberal democracy ship. Um, you know, they have the mantra of, uh, what was it, Breitbart, who said uh, you know, politics is downstream from culture. Like that really, uh, that really appealed to me when I left, when I abandoned, when I just rejected the left side of things, right. I was like, Oh, yeah. there's this nice little raft, right. That I can float on where I'm not on either side. So I'm safe. You can't call me a right leaning, you know, you know, whatever white supremacist. Yeah, I didn't drop those bombs Had nothing. Yeah. To do yeah. With yeah. Me, yeah. Right? I'm just right in the middle. And then, uh, but then I started asking questions about like, well, you know, the whole Breitbart politics is downstream from culture. You know, you simply ask, which many don't actually, well, what's, what's culture downstream from, right. That would be the you keep asking and then, you know, uh, you'll you know, it's not endless regress. I you know, I my view, it's it's definitely God. But you ask what is you could you could vaguely say uh, theology or philosophy is is culture is downstream from philosophy. So it's not just about a culture war. This is why I always make fun of the, the modern authorized right like Ben Shapiro, because he keeps people. It's a culture war. We're doing a culture war, culture war this. And, and there's never a he kind of flirts with Judeo Christianity, right? But he doesn't get to the core of the arguments about it. He just kind of lets it float. You know, it's out there, you know, it's kind of vaguely informed, but really it's a culture war. And, um, you know, same with like, so Alex, Alex Jones, like an info war. So you get sold these kind of lower form wars, which are valid in their own little, um, context, but, they're still informed how you ought to fight and operate in these little systems 
are still informed by something beyond the system itself. You, it, the system doesn't tell you um, which which is the right way. You're just saying it's a war. It's like saying you're playing a ping pong game, right? Well, it's not giving me the rules and everything and uh, why I ought to play the ping pong game. You're just playing the ping pong game. And, and so I started, you know, with, with people like Jay Dyer, I started questioning, well, what is the philosophy behind any of it, including pursuing science, empirical truths, philosophical truths? Um, and then how do you engage with these deeper level questions that everybody, by the way, interacts with, like morality, right, um, is such an important aspect of everything we do. Uh, because everyone is underneath it, always making a meta-ethical moral assumption, right? Yeah, I mean, so at some point, it's your actions that you have to look at. And I think for many people, it sounds like you kind of went through something like this too, getting into libertarianism and that sort of thing gives you that chance to actually not have a position on, on many things. And you can just kind of throw your hands in the air and say, and I don't want to harp on this. I left the whole libertarian podcast realm for a reason, Yeah, yeah, um, yeah too. but maybe a little harping, um, you know, it, it leaves you in this position to kind of be high and mighty and say, look, I, I don't agree with either of these sides. So I can just sit here and, and, what you mentioned earlier is that you're, this really resonated with me. You're, you're, you always end up searching for something, you know, searching for that great end. I mean, I was very involved in the Ron Paul movement starting around 2007, 2008 or so. And the big thing to everybody, like we knew Ron Paul wasn't going to become president and that was okay because all we were trying to do was enlighten people. All we were trying to do was tell them about how great the world could be. If only they read these several thousands yeah, to of books. Totally. <laughs> totally. I have a, a meme I haven't yet drawn where it's like someone being, uh, you know, um, you know, what is it called when you when when the people ambushed the people, someone's ambushed and, you know, they're surrounded and the per people are about to kill them. And the guy's like, but haven't you read Hayek or something like that? <laughs> like you start to realize that the whole libertarian thing uh, and I only did about a year or so stint of that because oh, you I got a I, short I, sentence. That's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I started to ask very easy questions. Like for instance, this, this notion, this Ian Randian notion of like Liberty being the ultimate virtue, like, and then from the libertarian perspective, the, the thing you hear is, you know, from the mal the Michael malices and so forth is like, you know, um, it's not hurting you. It's not taking your stuff. So why do you care? And it's like, well, you don't have children probably because, you know, a, a, a building shaped like a dildo uh, next to a school, from your view, you couldn't argue against it. It's not hurting anyone. It's not taking anyone's stuff. And then I realized, okay, so there's something deeper here. You know, uh, you can have a lawful society, okay. right? You can have a lawful society. That... I'm trying to share this. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Was, yeah. That's exactly, what I was to share. exactly, yeah, yeah. So you, can, you got my backup recording for a second, but uh, so, yeah, for, for those on the audio, I'm sharing Jim Bob's meme here. It d does show who is clearly Michael Malice uh, with a, it appears to be a, you know, don't tread on me shirt surrounded by, um, well, who you'd think he'd be surrounded by a ball gag guy, a purple dildo. And he's just saying, just don't, just don't just hurt don't. me or take my stuff. Right. Right. And that really, and he retweeted this and kind of responded to it. Uh, on Twitter or whatever, but uh, they never have good responses to this because they fundamentally think, um, you know, well, it's it can't be that bad as long as if it does, it's not hurting you directly or taking your stuff. And obviously, once you start uh, examining this, um, you realize that um, you could have a fully um, compliant uh, law, right? That, that are that are abiding by natural law or the libertarian uh, ethical uh, ethical standard. The um, argumentation ethics kind of position where you, there's no violence. So there, you could have a city of a society that's purely libertarian, that's doing doing very libertarian things and nobody treads on anyone else. And it can, can be completely degenerate. And so that kind of tension is never really addressed. And maybe it's starting to a little more. Hopefully people like um, Dave Smith are starting to see that this is not a complete thought and doesn't get us to uh, where you would want to be, because again, you can, uh, burning man is, you could say burning man and every activity that happens right in the dark and in the light and burning man, as long as there's consent, right? right? So you can be a good libertarian. You can be a good libertarian and not 
argue against degeneracy or self acts against yourself, right? Um, Many would even say you're a bad libertarian if you do argue. If you do, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that seems to be a problem there, and that's why most people abandon it because they they start to see these very simple, by the way, um, questions. N not that the answers are just simple, but the questions themselves are simple. Like, can you, you know, uh, for instance, there's a lot of debate whether uh, libertarianism is compatible with Christianity. And, and it's these reasons why they're not right. You can have a public um, guy uh, doing his thing publicly. You know, you know, we don't need to we don't need to put him by a playground. You could just put him out in public. Right. And so all of a sudden you're, you you start to see that, well, they're not hurting anyone directly and no one's being, you know, so, so these are decency codes. So what informs decency? Well, there's a whole other structure that's assumed there. It can't just be liberty. Because liberty doesn't assume decency, right? So once people separate liberty from decency and they understand, oh, okay, liberty from a Christian perspective itself um, as a virtue, as a, as, a, as a position to go toward is actually fairly satanic. I mean, it's not like it, – it doesn't tell you what's good. It doesn't tell you how you ought to act now that you have liberty, right? Uh, you know, and so – Liberty whatever you want. I mean, right. that's the, that is the right. ethic. It's, right. You should do whatever does feel good as right. long as you're not quote unquote hurting anyone else. And I think like the, the concept of harm and hurting totally gets lost there too, because it's basically assumed if you're not physically touching someone's body, then you're not causing harm, which completely puts aside, I mean, a thousand different things. I mean, just porn being porn, one of yeah, them mm -hmm. as, as a libertarian. Uh, and I had thought this for a long time too. What's the big deal? They're yeah. consensual adults. Right. Uh, someone is consenting to watch it. I don't see the problem. And, and now that, uh, that gets so easily unpacked when you even think about it for two seconds, but it's easy to not think about it when right. you're in that state of mind. Right. Yeah, totally. It, it like it, it actually, the irony with the libertarian mindset is that it actually invites a larger scale government to come in and then be the arbiter of decency. Because if you're, if you're sitting on the fence and you allow indecency, then suddenly the people who want decency are going to appeal to government. They're going to appeal to mm -hmm. local governance. They're going to appeal to pressure. They're going to appeal to all sorts of ways to maintain and, and establish and maintain decency in the communities that they're in, because now it matters most of the time because they have children. Sometimes uh, people wake up even without the children, they, they start to see this problem. And uh, yeah, the irony is that if you go full libertarian, it, it actually necessitates a sort of nanny state, if you will, um, to get involved with the, the part that they're not addressing, which is decency. Uh, it doesn't tell you how to be decent, right? It just says, don't take my stuff and, and whatnot. That doesn't mean that there aren't libertarians who argue for decency, uh, even from a moral or Christian standpoint. Uh, it's just that you don't need to, like you said, to be a good libertarian, right? Right. Yeah, and I, I suppose if you... If you have that libertarian political mindset, maybe that system could even work if everybody involved in it had that standard of decency and then maybe simply shaming people that were acting in a certain way. Maybe that might work. But when it's coupled with, but we can't make moral judgments about the, these things because they're consenting adults. Well, when you couple those, then then you're not you're obviously not going to see decency because that, that standard's just not there it's gone. on either side of it. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, exactly. So it's like liberty. I don't know. That's the whole enlightenment thing. And then it's followed by Ayn Rand and then all of the culture around it. And then, um, you know, the, that's our rebellious state also that it appeals to. It's like, I'm God, I'm my own Pope, you know, let me live my life sort of thing. Like, um, don't bother me. And, and I'm realizing, no, I have, to, you do bother people. I'll give you an example and probably move to another topic. I'm, I'm sure. Um, is that, uh, you know, I was at a public, um, pool for, for kids. I brought my kids there. There's like a slide. It's really fun and cool. The adults go, well, my wife noticed that there was like a maybe a 13 or 14 year old girl who was a counselor for very young kids. But keep in mind, there's like one, two, three, up to like 10 year olds in this area. And uh, she was wearing a very inappropriate thong. Mm -hmm. And this kind of like, oh, it's not hurting anyone. Right. Or it's not illegal. And then you start to go through these these sort of very uh, liber libertarian based um, thinking. Right. And. and from all of that thinking, you would never get to a point where you're arguing against this behavior that's otherwise not hurting someone directly and not illegal. And so 
you start to see that the intervention of like let people this this concept of letting people do what they want right just let them be live your life is nonsense it's not how it's not how traditions and cultures maintain themselves they maintain themselves through things that uh for the most part actually transcend law there are cultural norms um uh, ethical and tradition traditional norms that are upheld person to person with with actual confrontation so libertarian is very non-confrontational. Now, what happened is my wife actually called the town that we live in because we're a part of the town, right? And we said, this is happening, right? It's not a big, we're not making a big deal, but we want to make sure there are moral and ethical codes for public areas where there are children. See, this some is libertarians not... would say, oh, there's Jim Bob. Yeah, exactly. The Authoritarian. Like... Exactly. Exactly. And uh, yeah, I will. I'll call them in because if it wasn't them, if there wasn't a way to do it, there would I would invent a way to do it, right? If there wasn't already a structure, because they work for mm -hmm. the town, so they work for us, and so um, that's not that's not okay. And now there were other people who probably thought that's not okay. What do I do about it? And the difference is, someone did something about it. The person didn't get fired or anything, but now there's a standard in in that part of uh, the the public um, sphere that uh that now they know the standards are held because someone said something and so the, you know this notion of the karen right with the hair it's been memed appropriately um to be mostly a silly uh whiny position right the karen the the famous karen right but you can there's good karening uh you know it's the same how to be a good karen how to be a good I'll, I'll title exactly, this episode exactly <laughs> uh and as, as well there are there are things um that, and we can get sometimes into this. the manager has to be called i mean that's right you know? well we are managing we are managing each other we as a as a father you manage as a mother you manage and so it's not like we're just because we're adults we we're uh we've earned the right to not be bothered by our brother or neighbor about something that's that they find, you know, that potential, you know, you call them to the side and you say, hmm, that that seems to be something that's kind of been pushed away with these sort of atomization of, of families and individuals inside families that we all are in our own universe and we've earned it. And now that the 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 sort of like consumerist world where we can all get take on debt and operate in our own game system. Um, means that we don't get bothered, right? Don't bother us. I won't bother you. Leave us alone. Um, this is this is a decay to me. This is decay because there's no bond between neighbors and community and family members uh, that that necessarily becomes kind of um, confrontational. And it's this kind of concept of shielding yourself and being non-confrontational that I think is r really a detriment to upholding. Uh, Western traditions, uh, family, decency and communities and whatnot. And so um, that's something that I, I encourage people. There's a way to do it, of course. I'm not saying you just be a dick and run around, um, you know, hitting virtue hammer, hammering people. But there is a way to do it. And you are obligated as a man to actually maintain it. Now, I think this went away in like the 50s. You know, remember like the first introduction of the long haired sort of beatniks in the street or flailing about and they're filthy or whatever it is, right? This concept that you can act any way you want in public because of freedom, man. Well, somehow that won, right? And, and then, then the people who didn't want this, right, were called squares. Like, oh, you're going to remove that, right? And now what do you get? We get a, you know, we get these pride parades where people are doing S&M and all this stuff in front of children. And it's, to me, it's a natural progression. It's to, to me, it's this, it's, there's, it's not a surprise once you see like that progression start. Right. And, uh, this is mostly decency, right? It's not just appearance or something, right? It, it's, it's decency. And I think de indecency is pushed for one of the main, um, weapons against a, a cohesive traditional society, right? That's trying to uphold some standards beyond law. Uh, you push in decency and liberty, you're pretty much halfway there. You don't need to work that much hard, harder because from my view, the fallen nature of us actually is drawn to indecency and liberty, right? We, we kind of like, that's our part that we're like, can I, can I do that? Like, can I get away with this? And, uh, and so it's right there. I mean, it's a very strong thing and, you know, and, and we're in the middle of it now. 
I want to go back to earlier when you mentioned that you sort of looked further into the beliefs you, you, I don't know if they're beliefs per se, but the things you dabbled in new age type stuff, or I don't know if you like gave yourself a comparative religion class and sort of looked at other religions before, before coming fully back to Christianity. Obviously this could be a, a 40 hour podcast to really get to all to the bottom of all that, but maybe you could just sort of touch sure. on some of your journey there and like specifically what points along the way that you had these kind of moments where you said, okay, this, this feels like I'm orienting more towards the truth. Yeah, I did a lot of self-help. So when I was in Los Angeles, I got highly involved in a, um, I don't know if it's an LLC now. It's called Landmark Education. Uh, it w- the previous version in the 60s and 70s was called EST, E-S-T which was like uh, Warner Earhart, I think. You know, everything like the secret and all the self-help new agey stuff has come from it. Now, this these programs are very practical, uh, but they do borrow from a lot of... Um, they borrow Christianity, they borrow Hinduism, Buddhism, all of it, right? They'll just kind of put it all together in one package and um, sell it as like sort of communication technology, you know, um, distinctions. It's all self-help, right? It's all like, but it doesn't, it's not without a philosophy. It did have a philosophy that was kind of like, um, what was the, what was the slogan? It was a, a world that works for everyone, right? Very monistic. Sounds nice. Right? Right, right. Everything sounds nice with these things. Um, And so that introduced me to something higher. You know, when I was in that, it felt like something higher than just floating around as a hedonist or or whatever. Right. Um, It started it it called me to action to something bigger. Now, it was ultimately incoherent because it's just a hodgepodge of a different philosophies and and it doesn't really have a grounding for why you ought to make the world work for everyone or even even if that's a realistic or coherent um philosophy in general a notion itself but it did reintroduce me to some of these other concepts so it got me back it got me into you know whatever uh meditation and uh, you know yoga drawstring pants kale um (laughs) These kind of uh, things, and uh, and you know, in a way, that can lead you very f- into a broad, terrible place. But it can also lead you to seeing how nonsensical a lot of the, these things are. Now, they do have top; they have a topical layer of truth, right? A lot of these cultures, a lot of there, there is some truth in a lot of these things. Now, the the now to me, the the mistake people make is. They think because there's truth in a lot of these things that if you pick the truths off of the top and put them in a basket, the basket that you have now is the the collection of all truth. And therefore, Mm -hmm. your basket is the truth. Right. I would say, no, it's not you just picking off the top. There is a standard through which you need to appeal to in order to derive truth from those things. So when people say, oh, no, you know, Jim Bob, it's not one thing. It's all of the things. Right. And you go, well, if it's all of the things, that necessitates one thing that's not all of those things that determines the truthfulness of all of those things. I know that's a mouthful, but in other words, this perennial approach to all truths lead to the same truth, right? Um, There might be a half truth about that, but the thing is you can't just go through uh, aisle 10 of theology and worldviews in Walmart and fill your basket and feel like you've completed the, t- the task of establishing a, a, a fully fleshed out worldview. That is to say, it accounts for your metaphysics, your morality, and your epistemology. Now, the part that's missing usually is the epistemology. And all of these things inform each other, by the way. It's just that I went through that stage of collecting, right? Oh, that's Absolutely. good. I'll take that and I'll do that. It's you know? easy to do too right. when you're looking at other religions and you do see certain things like, well, this oh, this jives with, with mm-hmm. this. This just this actually does relate to my life. Okay. Right. So then but then you can easily get into this place where you think, well, all the religions are just kind of interpreting the world. They're all trying to kind of say the same thing, which isn't true. I mean, if you really break them down, they are no. saying very, very different things, but it's right. very easy to fall into that and say, well, everyone's just trying to figure things out. So I'll just, you know, grab, totally a little, grab a little from that. Absolutely. And it's very appealing, especially a certain age as, as we're looking at our own, uh, pasts, like they're between 20 and 30, sometimes 35. Um, we we're very drawn. To 40, but no yeah, 40, me too. Me too. I mean, I, I'm 41 now, so it wasn't that long ago where I started really fine tuning this stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, 
a very and speaking of like uh you know the roast I did of Aubrey Marcus this is the, he's like he's one of the main faces now of this sort of perennialistic look at at all things right it's all one monism monism but then it's dualism right it's back and forth between the two or or the gnostic sphere which is really interesting um uh, you know in the truther sphere gnosticism whether they know it or not if they're gnostics is um is rampant this kind of like uh and we, that's what we're talking about like when we pick off the top intuitively of what's true we become our own sort of like pope or god or or we're right. the standard right our, our our sense of resonancy man like it resonates we're the standard right we we yeah, say whatever it. resonates with me is right. the new truth Here right we go. exactly Here exactly exactly and so that seems to be fairly rampant which is fun and and i've gotten a lot of great feedback yes it's contentious yes when i go after people who are you know jim bob why are you infighting with the truth or community well the truth or community to me the truth can't be the description of stuff that you uncover it can't be the description of esoteric or, or uh, exoteric secret knowledge that you uncover under the rock with the numbers and the geometry and all this stuff, right? The truth has to be bigger and more transcendental than the description of things or, um, or uh, the world itself, right? This pursuit of worldliness, you know, that the, the truth is out there in nature um, or identical to nature. And, and that, that there, this, uh, assigning divinity to trees and rocks and and the formation or geometry or numbers is also as broken um if not in my view potentially more dangerous um than this sort of like half baked uh new age um you know shopping cart take that we just discovered because those people you know if we remember ourselves then we're, it's not like we were so committed to it that there was conviction. It was kind of like, yeah, man, it works. Or, dude, I'm not trying to fight, man. It's like that, right? It's very like, yeah, whatever. But the but when Just you go exploring, things, yeah, yeah, man. exactly. But that's why I say that the this current trend now, um, especially rampant in the truth or community, is is there's a lot of conviction. There's it's very much uh, significant. It's it's a matter of life and death or. Or saving the world, you know, in a lot of cases, they're, they're claiming that if you guys just, you know, f read all of these folders, right, that the terabyte of truth, right, that's in the folders, then you'll finally be able to see the, the evil cabal and what they're doing. And, and uh, seeing it's just, it's just another version of, well, just read Mises, just read right, Hayek. Well, right, just, exactly. just look at these numbers. Like exactly. if you figure out the numbers, you'll get the whole thing, man. Exactly. And then you'll be able to predict and then you know, that's just worldliness, right? We're, we're in the world, not of it. Like we're not here to find not like, uh, this is the distinction that I learned is, um, obedience, uh, versus pursuit of knowledge, right? This is, this is like burned into Christianity from the start where there's a, there's a road and you go knowledge or obedience, right? And we're always faced with knowledge and obedience. Oh, but, but the knowledge, like, you don't understand, Jim Bob, if you just figure out and, and they're all rehashing stuff again. I'm 40. Like I, I discovered the 9-11 thing years ago. Like a lot of these things are just rehashed things. And we go, OK, I don't need your decoder ring to know that one eight one eighth of a building can't decimate and dust turn the bottom seven eighths of it, you know, into dust at free fall speed. I know that I don't need to add or do a calculator. I, I know it. Um, and so. I don't There's know. There's something this... to be said for sim for simple instinct too. And right. Just just being able to decipher deception, not necessarily mm -hmm. decipher a code. Right. And I think a lot there do seem to be that same thing in what you might call the truth or conspiracy world, where you know it's not about the instinct. It's not about like look how obviously this the fake this is or what yeah. an obvious lie it is. It's it's like here's the full you know look at all the engineers. It's like my god, but and most people aren't going to be won over by that anyway. No, they're they actually get bogged down and they they. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel uh, you're going to isolate yourself and you're going to push people away because it's manic. Right. And I went through it. I, I, I mean, I remember sending the folders to my family about 9-11 and um, so, <laughs> some of these um, ootings. I don't know if you're, you're on YouTube. Ootings, uh, you know, ass ass ootings. And things like that. What that's referencing. Like, oh. uh, like Matt, you know. Oh, oh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I got you. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it never it never works. Right. People aren't moved, by the way, by information. 
You know, they're not moved by this. Also, something that pushed me closer to Christianity is that it's who we are as it's it's our personhood. It's our energies. It's our compassion. It's a whole transcendental category um, that moves people, that affects people. It's music. Right. And and worship and all these things. Right. It's never dude. I found the secret right folder like like that. All that does is then push you further down a pursuit of more knowledge. And that's that's a, to me a satanic trick is to push you down a spiral of more knowledge because there is an endless amount of knowledge that can be sort of reproduced in different ways. And you would never know when you got to it's like fractals, right? Where you're like, dude, look at this fractal. And then you figure something out. And then they say the meaning of the fractal. And then you go, well, yeah, but go deeper, dude. I, you know, I did that fractal like two years ago. You know, I'm on <laughs> fractal 29 or whatever. And uh, it's endless. It doesn't give you uh, communion with God. It doesn't make you a better father. It doesn't make you a better friend or a better husband or wife. It makes you prideful of the assumed wisdom, the ersatz wisdom the fake false wisdom of knowledge. And it gives you a sense of pride that you know something that, mm. Oh, I'll, I'll tell I was, dude, I was where you were at, bro. You'll see, you'll read the stuff. And, and, and it just doesn't, it's nonsense, right? It doesn't give you anything. And, and I, and a lot of these people, it's really funny, all, all the parallels, because it really does parallel like the journey through libertarianism and the journey. Cause it is always just comes down to like, Oh, you'll get there. You just need to read yeah. the next two, you'll mm -hmm. get there. You just need to look at the Marty Leeds video or, or right. whatever, whatever, whatever right. it may be. Yeah. And that's why it get it pisses people off because materialists, um, a lot of these, uh, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of truthers are materialists. They think there's a, an outcome that they can assign is equal to the good that they can get to. If people just like take on crypto and reject the B system and this and that, uh, whatever it is, whether it's homesteading or, or whatever, that there's some idolized outcome that you can get to if you just take these steps, right? And, um, you know, whether it's Gematria or who's the dude who like kind of established the um, removing yourself as a person, right? And establishing yourself as a person uh, in in a, an economic government system as opposed to a, a number as a social security number. There's all these routes, right. Of, of seeking true Liberty really, which is kind of interesting. The parallel is Liberty, isn't it? It's like mm -hmm. you can be liberated mm -hmm. with your knowledge. You can be right. liberated from these systems. And um, I guess it, it does piss people off because someone will go, well, Jim Bob, what are you, <clears throat> what's your solution? I, well, my worldview doesn't have a solution for this world, right? My, my solution is a spiritual solution. So it's not like my solution doesn't apply to this world as it is. This world, in my view, is fallen. Now, are there short term, um, you know, pragmatic solutions to certain problems? Yes. That doesn't mean you just give up or you don't fight against the evil forces. People There's miss always a thong at the pool to right? <laughs> yeah. or, or something like that. <laughs> exactly. It's not it doesn't mean stop and don't fight against evil and these things, but you, but this, the, the, the Liberty is not uh, because you've unshackled yourself from certain systems, right? Because you can be unshackled and, and totally spiritually not liberated. You could be totally free and off the grid and stuff and still be a degenerate, right? You can, this is the problem, right? Where you're not dealing with one aspect of reality. You're dealing with a metaphysical spiritual aspect and it's all it's completely incoherent to assign physical remedies for spiritual problems right how could you assign it's just the same with the gender stuff it's like if it's of a if it's a construct right and you couldn't tell me a standard for the term then why would you take a physical approach to matching your body to this thing that's a concept right it it's a fit it's a carnal remedy for what you're assuming is a metaphysical problem. And, and th that's just an inverted, uh, version of it. But, um, you know, that's kind of where I, where I'm at now, where I, I just look out there in the, in the world, in the truth sphere, in the political sphere. And all I see is materialists, right. That are, that are assigning good to very specific outcomes that if you all just X, then why could be possible? Can't you see this, Jim Bob? And, and I, I see where you're coming from. I've thought that. 
I just don't believe that because I think it's 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 logically incoherent. It doesn't work. And I think that's one of the most difficult things for a lot of people that do see a lot of legitimate problems in the world to to sort of embrace uh, because it's almost in some ways you almost have to say, well, I can't change all of this stuff necessarily. Um, I can't save the world, which is something that when you see huge problems, whether it's 9-11 or realizing this is a lie or COVID, whatever it may be, and you realize the truth or some version of the truth, you you want to tell everybody and you want to solve it and you want to make it better because you're living in this world. So I think for people that do live in the material and that haven't at least started to open themselves up to, to seeing that there's something greater beyond this, then yeah you do get stuck you do run into a wall because at some point you can't fix it you can't fix all of it you can only control certain things within yourself but if you don't believe that there's something beyond that then you are you do get kind of stuck and then yeah this all becomes very obvious yeah it's a temporal uh assumption Uh, there are people who really can't get behind that there's something else right or truly in their faith like that there that this isn't this is temporal and they go well yeah i kind of get the concept but um, but really, we got to save, you know, we got to do this now or right? because this is all we have. Well, no, then you don't really believe that 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 this is not all there is. You actually think this is all there is. And from that perspective, at least they're consistent with their views that if this is all there is, then, yes, you would go to all of these uh, very materialistic outcome based uh, solutions to very material, temporal uh, uh, problems. Right. They're temporal problems. Now, spiritual problems aren't that's the distinction in the category that's why i think it's a category error to be like it's the same reason an atheist goes like well i don't believe in god because there's no evidence you go (laughs) like this is also a category error like you know there are there's a whole category of things you believe in that there are no there's no evidence you can't show me you can't materialize the laws of logic or numbers or meaning or information you can't hold it um and so why do you believe that? Right. And, and you realize there are fundamental categories to reality that all work together. And the standard for which uh, needs to, to my view, necessarily needs to be a, a, um, a mind, uh, you know, an absolute transcendental mind, because we are in our reality dealing with mind. We're dealing with the unity between the external world, our mind and concepts. The fact that those things go together from a materialist view should be a miracle, should be um, it shouldn't make sense. Right. From a materialist perspective, that the fact that there's a unity between concepts, mind and the external world such that we all can hold um, concepts over time and discuss anything in any sort of intelligible way is 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 truly miraculous. I just think that most people don't think of it. They just go, no, we have a physical world and I have a a brain that looks at it. And then I, and then I, you know, kind of describe it and then you describe it. And then we agree on the truth. And you're like, no, that's begging the question. Like talking about the fundamental preconditions for being able to even do anything. Right. And uh, a lot of people just don't think about this. And I think it is a, a result of sort of the lingering fart of enlightenment where these guys didn't they they didn't find it necessary to go back further and justify wait how do we how do we justify the existence of logic um meaning the whole category all the categories that we assume before we start doing this thing called philosophy um and now it's i think with christianity in its pockets at least being reinvigorated i think people are starting to question these things again and go wait a second you know i can't just i can't just take all of these things ad hoc just because they're useful. I can't, you know, at least the honest people are, are looking at it that way. One thing that stands out to me, maybe we can touch on for, for a minute that you, you briefly kind of went over in, in one of your recent live streams, but it, it really highlighted a lot of what we're talking about here is they had this recent like evolution video where they show the dog <laughs> oh like becoming the whale or whatever. And, <laughs> And there's really two kinds of people. Well, that's not necessarily true. With this one, I did see a little more like even sciencey people sort of like thinking it was silly. But, you know, there's the kinds of people that just say, well, look, it's evolution. I mean, this takes a million. And they just, mm. but they just assume it all. It's all packed in there. And meanwhile, like they, they, we don't have the dog that's half the whale. We don't have any of the steps in between. They just say, well, obviously we know that it went from here to here because look at this. So and I think that's so baked into to so many different concepts we look at where so much is assumed because we were taught it growing up and it's just the way it is. So then every attempt to argue against it already assumes what you're trying to. Absolutely. Argue against. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're allowed to argue against evolution as long as you start with the presupposition of naturalism. 
So you start with the Big Bang and then right, we can right, talk right. about what happened. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then so you can't talk, you know, I've done debates and w- what I really see with evolution is a, um, to me, it's a, an effective way of describing what's going on is that um, you get someone, a proponent of such an idea to draw a circle on the on the the chalkboard, but they don't want you to get closer. If you start going, well, let me look closer at the circle that you just drew and they go, well, it's probably best you stand further away to see the full circle. And then you sneak up when they leave and you see that the circle is actually drawn with a lot of lines that actually aren't connected at all. They actually have quite a distance be- behind them, between them. But from 33 feet away, uh, it looks like a perfect circle. It looks like it's all connected. It, it, oh, I, I get that concept. You know, a lot of time. You know, I just give myself a lot of time and the whale and the thing could become a whale and the whale could be a ostrich and whatever it is. But once you ask some fundamental questions about um, about the process or the method or the mechanism at a high resolution, suddenly they freak out. Right. They need to argue from a naturalistic presupposition, but not just that, a naturalistic presupposition tied to a very ambiguous, um, you know, wide scale resolution, resolution of the concept. So it's like it has to be seen as this big thing. Right. Very broad, big thing where you can't understand it because there's so much time you go. Well, no, let's if you understand it at that level, then you understand it at a at a level. Right. Because they always talk about micro. Right. So these kind of things must tie together. Uh, ultimately, they'll avoid a biogenesis, of course, because uh, I'll ask someone about evolution and they'll be like, well, it's just the uh, random you know, mutations in a population. I go, how do you get a population? They go, I'm not talking about abiogenesis with you. you go, how did you get a population of giraffes? Well, I can't. We're not going to discuss this. This is not in evolution is about. Well, there were snails and they started walking yeah, exactly. one day and they had the to reach the leaves. Yeah, so totally. that's, come on. Jim yeah, Bob. Duh. Jeez. Yeah. Or even the, you know, the human thing. It's hilarious to get someone to bite the bullet and say their ancestor was a strawberry. <laughs> um, and but wh- I'm crazy for believing a creator created the very complex and intelligible universe. Um, it's it's just funny, you know. This is my great 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 grand uncle, exactly. potato. <laughs> exactly. They're like, well, it's just only, it's, and they always use this DNA stuff. Uh, it's amazing how, um, how the whole DNA thing, like you're you're part banana because we found similar uh, visual structures, right? But then you then you realize, wow, that really paved the way for, let's say, the PCR machine telling you that you, you know, you're going to have AIDS in a year or whatever, because they found with enough like, you know, amplifications and cycles inside your your skin. They found you're gay. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Across, you know, they just it's like if you look close enough, you could find like, wow, uh, Jim Bob, it's weird, but you actually have rhinoceros horn in your elbow somehow. Well, yeah, if you amplify in the cycle, leave the cycles enough, you'll see a pattern because we're all biological. So that these patterns are going to, you know, resurface and layer over and they'll be close enough. Right. But that says nothing about origin. It says nothing about anything. It all it says is that things visually look similar at a certain resolution. Right. And, and of course, that would be the case. Because structures need to occur in a certain way for them to be structures, right? And so mm-hmm. this is a very simple way of looking at it uh, such that it kind of highlights the, how the deception happens. And, and the deception happens usually, uh, whether it's the moon landing or anything, it, it happens because people, the ordinary people, don't have a reference point. They're using, um, you know, there's no reference point. So whether it's evolution or let's say the moon, you didn't. In 1969, the ordinary person didn't have a reference point to go, that doesn't look right. Maybe there are a bunch that actually said that anyway, but you'd have to have a real version of the moon landing to say Mm -hmm. that it was fake because, and that's the paradox of the moon landing uh, denier that I am, is that, you know, to, to ultimately make the claim, you need the real version of something to then pair it and be like, that was fake. Now that's a, that's a, it becomes a problem. Uh, But that ability to lie at a massive scale, it's often, what is it? The little mustache man. I don't even know if he said this, but it was like a big lie. What um, Tell a big enough lie. People won't even question it because it's it would be so absurd, right? Or something like that. And I don't think that's exactly, it's, it's almost there. I think it, what it is is that you don't tell a lie big enough where 
people Tell don't lie where have, you couldn't see the truth you anyway. Couldn't, yeah, you couldn't. You wouldn't know what method to use, right? Because it's mm -hmm. out of your reference frame. You can't reference anything. It's so it's so out there that there's no way to reference anything as opposed to um, Mark says he's in a certain state right now. Um, I could just believe you or I can go through the method of locating you or sending someone where you are, where you show up, they show up in the screen and go, yeah, Mark's here. These, these are, this is where we're able as normal people, as, as ordinary peasants to interact with certain claims that are local. But if something's abstract and out there or non-local, we really are in an argument with authority constantly. And then we're in, argue, we're in an argument with people who just appeal to the authority, right? Mm -hmm. All right? Even if in their view, it's a valid authority in the matter. And that, that's the problem with the whole truth or thing is, as well, is that yeah. it, it definitely, it, it makes sense that people go toward knowledge because that's all they're operating with at the moment. And these lies are so big and so vast that, people feel helpless and knowledge is the only thing they can grasp to fight against that kind of deception war. It's Info like the Gnostic thing again. I mean, just even with like, when it comes to evolution or the moon landing, it's like, you're never going to, you're not going to understand it, but we know how it works and right. we figured it out. Right. We can't explain to you all the numbers we put in the code that that girl made yep. the code of all the papers. Nope. Right, totally. We're not going to know that, but mm. she, she did it and just accept it. Because, right. Come on. But then how do you really counter that? Cause you can't, you can't break down that paper of code that they lost no. or whatever and, and prove it's wrong. No, no. You just have to look at very – like I use very simple uh, reasoning. I just say, well, I mean I have a one good enough reason to reject it is that there's – no. I've not um, – you know, like they did the first heart transplant I think in 64. Now, now if, if, if I saw the first heart transplant as a, some sort of boomer in 64 and I went into a coma and I woke up in 2022 and uh, they were like, oh, I'm so glad you woke up. The bad news is you need a heart transplant. And I go, well, thank God they did that in 1962. And, they, and the doctor goes, well, we lost the technology. I, I wouldn't, and it's just a little too much work to put it back together. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I would fundamentally reject that. I think anyone should reject that right now. Someone could Which, counter. But for people who don't know what Jim Bob's talking about, like this is literally NASA's line now. Right. They say we can't go to the moon because, or I guess they're trying to send this Artemis thing up uh, there that keeps getting delayed yeah. and keeps having all these problems. But they, they, their literal story is we lost the technology, we flushed it down the toilet or whatever it might be, that we lost the stack of papers yeah. with the code. Yep. And now it's just too much, it's too much too work. Much work. To yeah. yeah, they they actually say they destroyed it. They don't even say they lost it. They said they destroyed it. That's what Don Pettit said. We, de we destroyed the technology <laughs> and it's too hard to pick up. Um, the only reasonable um, alternative view, the way to look at it, is that they they never did this or they did this, right? If, if I granted it, which I wouldn't, but if I did grant it, it was it would be that they are now need to use that as like a cover for more local technology. That to me is more reasonable that that all of the money laundering that I believe exists in that agency and whatnot, that uh, I, I believe any of the work they're actually doing would be more like local weapon weapons and stuff like um, whether it's holograms or. Um, you know, and maybe uh, the space stuff is a cover, right? For right. It keeps you looking. Yeah, thing. yeah. It keeps you looking up beyond. So if mm -hmm. you look up and you look far away, you might not see something that's like the screen right here or, or right here. And so, um, you know, if you're actually doing technology stuff and actual engineering, obviously the application isn't going to be uh, the Elon Musk version of like, we're going to, we're going to put a thing on Mars and it's going to be amazing. What? No, no one, you, you get the reaction of like, well, no, I mean, the people here can't even live, uh, you know, up to par. Well, why would we go to Mars? And you realize you're just uh, you know, they sell an out there version of sci-fi. And I think it's mostly distractions from more local things, you know, whether it's uh magnetic, um, or, or sonic weaponry, right? Frequency weaponry, um, visual. Uh, and I think NASA, what it really does is, is I, I've always referred to it as the, the, uh, the guidance system because they refer to their own system, the guidance system, which they're referring to is, you know, the, what you said, the, the woman who made the stack of papers who wrote the system that the, the, the rocket is thing guiding. Thing. It's, just the, it's, it's like, the, come on, you're just, yeah, you're just messing yeah. with us now, right? Yeah, totally. Um, and, uh, and uh, the real guidance system 
um, is NASA's narrative to the populace, to the to the population. They're guiding the cosmology. They're guiding um, a lot of the the way in pe which people relate to themselves as human beings on on the in this sphere in, in this world in this uh, plane, however you want to look at it. And uh, that's very powerful. That's really the guidance system. And then they hire all of these sort of like neurodiverse autistic people to work in these these places where they're just looking at screens, right? Oh, I got a lanyard. I can't believe it. I didn't even graduate, but somehow working for NASA landing a, a rover. I'm, well, how do you know? Well, look, it's on this computer. I put my VR on and they're telling me that I'm landing a Mars rover through my video game that I'm playing. And, and you realize, wow, they're... The, the 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 people who work for NASA are actually sort of the rovers, which is really weird to see is that, you know, NASA's system actually can control the people who are compartmentalized in the, in these these agencies stuck in a room, big screens, right? Screens <laughs> telling them everything. And uh, they are actually kind of the rovers They they're NASA's controlling them. Right. Mm. But they think they're controlling some Jeep rover thing what 83 million miles away right in and real then time. that's the that's the counter what you what do you think they really have them just sitting there controlling yeah. nothing Come yes on. yes and now and now is the perfect time to launch this kind of stuff and it's not an accident that uh nasa is now uh uh teaming up with like the real engine number five right uh, that's like the most high advanced um because most of their cgi is total garbage but they're getting into uh real t real engine um, and a lot of virtual technology crossover stuff, augmented reality that that fundamentally probably uh, confuses the people, because if you can experience it like it's real in a virtual setting, then you're almost more likely to um, to be partial or sympathetic to it being like that somewhere else because you're invested in it being real. So because you're like, oh, I experienced it. You go experience what? And they go, it was close to like the real thing. Well, if it was fake, you didn't experience anything, right? You experience has to, for it to be virtual reality. Right. There has to be a reality. Yeah, reality, it's exactly. It's you. it's a per perfect trick. It's gonna it's gonna work, by the way. Uh, unfortunately, because we think, you know, we've exposed this stuff enough where they show a, a shitty cartoon and we start to see in the comments like, oh, people are actually getting it. Like they're actually seeing that this is nonsensical. But there's always a new trick around the corner. This is why. Pursuing knowledge and trying to fight a knowledge war isn't worth it. It's not going to give you any peace of mind. Uh, it'll give you peace of mind. It won't give you any peace um, uh, spiritually. It'll you'll have understanding of something. You'll be able to see it when it happens. You, oh, but I'm telling you, if you keep going down these roads where uh, the the you know. Uh, NASA turns a corner in the next 10 years and sells you another massive lie. And you, you look around and people are buying it again, right? Yeah. You're going to get upset, right? You're just going to get upset. Same thing with the Karunka thing. They're, you think they're done with like, um, f you know, over exaggerated, you know, you know, boogeyman, you know, things that can go in your nose. No, no, they, they've established that it actually works. That's what, what they've done. They've done a pr proof of concept and it's not a black pill. It's just that, you know, knowing when it happens, yeah, you can tell other people, but you know, that doesn't Might impress change. your friends at parties, but it's yeah. not going to stop it from happening. It doesn't stop it. There's no numbers. Weird parties, maybe. Yeah, we, yeah exactly. <laughs> not in exactly. most parties. Um, Jim, Bob, I really appreciate you coming on, man. I think uh, if you guys thought getting into the, the space talk was a little weird, just wait, because we're going to hop into the smoke filled room and get even weirder. But before we wrap up here on the main show, Jim, Bob, just let everybody know everywhere they can find all your stuff. I mentioned a couple things at the top there, but feel free to plug away and everything you got going on. Oh, sure. Yeah. Made by Jim Bob. You could find my uh, most recent book, Savage Means Volume 4, Post-Truth Booster, appropriately named. Uh, basically, an almanac, a, a time capsule of all of the absurdity in the last year and a half or so. It's uh, my favorite uh, volume so far. Um, these books are limited, so uh, grab them. Uh, they're all signed, uh, but uh, they're limited runs, and I don't print my books again. And then the rest is made by Jim Bob at YouTube or uh, Instagram, made by Jim Bob. Jim Bob, definitely checking him out. I, I found myself um, spending way too many hours, perhaps per week, uh, checking out those streams because once you hop in, it, it's hard to hop out because you really have a blast thanks. in there. Um, so I definitely highly recommend following Jim Bob. Jim Bob, thanks so much for coming on my show. 
Ain't no problem. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with the great Jim Bob. If you enjoyed this conversation, I highly encourage you to go and subscribe to his channel made by Jim Bob over on YouTube. Subscribe to his Instagram where you can find all of his uh, cartoons and memes and just a plethora of great content. Of course, there's even more content with Jim Bob behind the old paywall. If you subscribe on Patreon, subscribe star Rockfin, you get the full extended versions of all these episodes, including the smoke filled room segment where we discussed a little bit more about Jim Bob's thoughts on NASA and the moon landings, including the black magic origins of the NASA space program. Uh, we also got Jim Bob's thoughts on characters like Elon Musk and Donald Trump and just how they operate in our crazy political, spiritual reality here that we're dealing with. So check all of that stuff out in the smoke filled room segment. You can find all of the links you need over at markclair.com. That's M A R C C L A I R.com. Uh, don't forget you can support me at so many different levels, including the highest level, the Lucky 77s on Patreon, which my good friend Jared Wall was the very first subscriber of. And because of that, I get to mention his amazing product, his amazing website, thchempspot.com, where he delivers fantastic Delta 8 legal THC products directly to your door, and you get 15% off your order by using discount code. Now, you got to do a little work here. You got to spell my name right. Discount code Mark, M A R C, over at THC hempspot.com uh, premium subscribers also currently have access to my interview with Dexter De La Paz from Timeline Earth the Scarlet Thread Society they also have my discussion with Father Turbo Qualls just a couple of absolutely mind blowing conversations those are already up there for my subscribers for a mere eight bucks a month you can get access to all of this content the extended versions of every episode a couple weeks earlier than everybody else and on top of that you get shows that I do even in addition to those, including what I just did, Mark's Monthly Musings, where I recap the month that just came, the month before, as well as uh, I look ahead at the month coming. I also discuss a lot of the behind the scenes of the, the episodes, my personal thoughts on them, as well uh, as talk about things in my own life, things I've been reading, things I've been watching. Uh, one of those is the show Agent Apocalypse, and I'm also doing another bonus show with our good friend Pete Quinones of The Pete Quinones Show. We're going to do a show discussing and breaking down that series, Ancient Apocalypse, on Netflix, which ties into a lot of the conversations I end up having with Father Turbo Qual. So if you're behind the paywall, you really get to see all these connections get made. So check out all the links at markclair, M-A-R-C-C-L-A-I-R.com. Until next time. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.